Okay, Craig, can you hear me? Perfect. Oh, wonderful. Hey, it's great to have you here. Um, to many of our listeners, uh, I'm speaking with Craig Williams today, and we're going to be talking about a topic that he and I have spent a lot of time uh, discussing, and it's the relationship of body-centered practices as well as mind training, because these do go hand in hand to Western esotericism, and particularly modern esotericism, um, and what that means to us. Many of you may know Craig from his many numerous, uh, well, podcast interviews, uh, his publications. Uh, you're the author of, is it four books? It's uh, right, uh, Patrick right, Physics, four. one and two, two right, volume, right, right. Twi uh, uh, Twilight in the Desert, Entering the desert, right? Entering the desert, entering the desert, and Cult of Golgotha. Right, which, perfect. Uh, I, I've done reviews for these, uh, the two of them. I haven't done a review for tantric physics yet. Uh, and I personally found your approach in those two books uh, to be very informative and useful. Uh, but they're not for the beginner. And I right. want to stress that. Uh, they're for someone who does have some experience and is willing to enter into that uh, strange twilight land of where does imagination uh, affect reality and where does reality affect imagination? It really is a, a domain of the mind and of the, and particularly of that phrase again, let me reuse it, imagination. So that does play a big part in practices, both East and West, uh, and how we use it and how we not get trapped by it or abused by it. So kind of that with the setup, uh, let's kind of just, let me ask you a question and say, from your experience in um, traditional Indian practices, uh, Western esotericism, because you do have experience in Martinism and Gnosticism, mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, I think Voodoo, mm -hmm. but what would you say are the, right now in 2020, the major problems facing someone either new to Western esoteric practices or someone who's been in them for a while? That's a good question. I, I think uh, fundamentally, <clears throat> it's that there doesn't seem to be a lot of cultivation of what we would say in Sanskrit of viveka or discrimination. And typically, it seems from my experience in the Western esotericism field, it seems to be usually people are memorizing a bunch of information, um, collecting a lot of books, maybe joining an organization and then it just kind of seems to stop there. Um, I, I don't see a lot of manifestation of their work. Um, um, they might just continue to do the same golden dawn rituals or OTO rituals or Martinus rituals. But after that, it doesn't seem to produce anymore. It's almost like if, if, you know, if you had a bunch of people go to school for physics and then no one got a job, everyone just kind of stayed at home after college. Um, so I think that's one thing, but I think the other idea that I'd like to touch upon is there doesn't seem to be a lot of work on deconditioning the mind, on kind of focusing on what is their perception of reality, how can they tell when something is just the imagination versus a doorway into the imaginal, um, and then what are the ramifications of their practice, what are their practice, what, is, what effects will the practice have on their nervous system, on their body, and how will that affect their perception of reality. I think it's interesting that you state that the discrimination is lacking. And when we look at the Golden Dawn system or any of those systems rooted in the, uh, the, the, the notion of the Golden Rosenkreuz, uh, where we talk about virtues and vices that are applied to the tree of life, the first virtue which you must have is discrimination. Exactly. And in fact, that word has gotten such a bad rap that some people have changed it to discernment. But yes. really... We, we discriminate all the time. Uh, I was listening to the Swami Rama, who uh, is well known for his expertise in um, the tantric practices or the yogic practices, excuse me, regarding uh, the psychosomatic medicine, mind-body connection, which he demonstrated uh, in the 50s, 60s, 60s and 70s. Uh, he was a subject of, of major research. And he talked about the importance of discrimination and discrimination really is knowing karma. If this, then that, if that, then this. So the failure that people don't want to discriminate simply means they're, they're not even prepared to begin the journey. Exactly. 
No, I agree. And I think that's, uh, we, we can see that happening time and time and again. And it, not only is it, are they not encouraged, you know, they're, like you said, they're actually discouraged for that. Now there doesn't seem to be a lot of tools that they have to develop that discernment. Uh, you know, typically from the, like to use Swami Rama there, that we have, you know, all the different limbs of Raja yoga, all the different paths of yoga, which are developing the mind or stilling the mind or clearing the mind or calming the mind, all these different things. And I don't see a lot of Western esotericisms providing those tools for people um, with that. Um, and, I, and I think you're right that changing of the term from discernment or rather from discrimination into discernment is very telling. And that they all, that I see a lot of people almost have the idea that if you, if you're discriminating uh, from reality, that it's almost like in some kind of an elitism, you know, who are you to say this is better than that? Who are you to say that that's better than this? Um, and that, that was a fundamental idea from the traditional systems from the East. That's interesting that you point that out because again, when I look at many of the things that get posted on social media, uh, I see a lot of people saying, well, you know, we don't judge. Well, the fact of the matter is we judge every day. We have yeah. to judge what is good for us as well as not good for us. But the, these practices are and have always been elitist. By right. their very nature, they weed people out. Without a doubt. I mean, that's what we do in medical school. That's what they do in law school. Um, and that's what all these Indian systems have done for for generations, literally. And so f to act that now in the contemporary times that A, that's not important, or that not only is it not important, but that actually might be bad, um, is a very dangerous um, idea, in my opinion. I want to come back to that, particularly in reference to the notion of willpower, uh, what it is, how it's cultivated, and also solving one's problems. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, kind of looking at the nature of the mind, uh, I don't want to kick the golden dawn too much, but it's, it's easy to, because so many people are familiar with its system yes. Um, yes. and what is presented as the system. So using that as a framework, many people get into it or similar systems. They're constantly memorizing terms. They're involved in a great deal of ritual, which visualization, which uses an aspect of their mind. But once they've created these massive visualization structures, and, and this is where they're referring to Agrippa, because he speaks a great deal about the power of visualization in the mind. Yes, Whether yes. we're referring to Agrippa or we're referring to, say, the Golden Dawn, or which comes after it, many people don't understand, or they seem to build these imaginative constructs, which instead of being a vehicle that allows them to enter into a, a heightened state of awareness, it becomes kind of a trap, yes. a fantasy land. It, yeah, it becomes like a mirage um, and, and not a mirage that they, that they realize is a mirage, right? I mean, we can look at the transformation of consciousness from a, like from a tantric perspective where it's almost artistic, right? We can use our imagination or we can use visualizations, mantras, yantras, um, substances, experiences to transform our consciousness. And that we know on some level, using our viveka or our discernment, that some aspects of this are less real than others. But we know that. And there are tools that allow us to open a doorway into something deeper. But if you just don't even know that it's a tool or, or you don't even know that it's real, or, or better yet, you kind of ironically think it, everything's the same no matter what, um, that's to me where we get the cracks in the wall and I get concerned about everything from parasitic entities kind of leeching off people to just literally kind of burn out of their nervous system um, and frazzled uh, emotional experiences of life. Now, we had mentioned about discernment and uh, two things there. One is when I look at the different systems of Western esotericism in the 20th century, the only one that I am really familiar with that spent a lot of time cultivating the mental powers and the power of visualization, the power of concentration, uh, and some even some notion of discernment was Amwork, particularly right. the old school stuff from about 1915 to about 1985, because the lessons didn't change much in that time frame. They didn't change from about mid-90s. Mm -hmm. um, but within that time frame, there was uh, a great deal of uh, uh, mental conditioning and training. Uh, that allowed you to do things. So it wasn't heavily ritualistic. That's my point. It really did resemble uh, a kind of a form of Raja Yoga in that right. its emphasis was on mind training. 
what's going on in your own mind? How do you condition and recondition your own mind? Uh, what is the power of uh, auto-suggestion or self-hypnosis, as we like to call it? But really, it's deconditioning your mind and reconditioning your mind and understanding sure. how it functions. But mind there was still just a vehicle, not an end in and of itself. Uh, that as a setup, the other system which I find useful is... Um, Oh, it just skipped me. I'll come to it later. Okay. But uh, it has to do with uh, how we reason uh, and uh, how we think. And that many people don't understand, you know, just even the basic nature of, of, of thought process. And they, they generalize too much. They yes. personalize too much. They emotionalize their problems. Uh, maybe you could comment on that for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that brings up a really good point is one of the, the reasons why we learn about the functions of the mind. We learn about the aspects from the mind and it, whether we want to call it tantric systems or Vedic systems or that what I sometimes refer to in my writings as esoteric Hinduism is that they're literally kind of teaching the, the, the environment of the mind. They're teaching the architecture of the mind. And then we, once you know the architecture of the mind, then you're able to deconstruct it or rebuild it. It's much like medicine, right? In medicine, you're, you, you learn all the different systems of the body, and then you learn pathology, you learn what can go wrong. And then when you start to learn what can go wrong, you're also learning how it functions correctly. And then over time, that starts to develop in your mind this kind of type of reasoning. You, you start to understand and think about how things are working. So that's what many of the Vedic systems do. They teach people, okay, there's, you know, what you think of the mind is only this, but there's a deeper aspect of the mind called buddhi, and that's closer to this. And then there's the manas part of the mind, and then the andriyas and the senses. And so it's kind of giving all these aspects so people can step back and think, wow, I, I used to think I was hungry. Now I don't even know who I am. Um, you know, I, I used to think I was angry. Now I understand that that part of me is just a surface part. So I think that's why it's so important. Um, if you don't understand that, or if you just don't explore that, then you think that you're having some radical experience and it's only just an emotional experience or someone is taking a substance and they think it means it's going to change your life, but it's just a chemical reaction in the body. Um, you know, you could have so many examples of that if you don't understand what's making up the fabric of the mind. Maybe you could comment on that uh, in terms of the nature of the mind for a second because, or for a few moments, because, you know, when I look at the way the mind is presented in a lot of uh, esoteric schools, it, it is from a very modern perspective, which is fine because right. it, uh, it, it's the way we understand the language. However, what I've noticed is it tends to be presented hierarchical yes. rather than kind of organic. And if I remember, as I mentioned to you, uh, in the early 80s into the 90s, uh, I spent uh, a fair amount of time uh, with, uh, with swamis. It was mostly from the Ramakrishna order. Uh, these folks are very old school. Uh, I, I knew quite a few uh, very accomplished uh, Indians. They were, they were lay people, but they were very accomplished in their practice. And um, their notion of the mind, of course, those four parts of the mind that you just mentioned, was often presented as a circle. Yes. Okay. Yes, and that's yes. what you were doing is you were as a cross, like we would think of the typical symbol from Alkut or the typical symbol of the equal arm cross, as we see in the in a ritual work where you have the four quarters. And your goal was not to treat each one as a discrete and isolated entity, but to recognize the relationships, these four qualities of I believe it's uh uh, manas, a booty, uh, chita, and we call it ego, uh, exactly. or sense, sense of I ness, yeah, uh, and what they mean, and yeah. and that when they are coordinated, enlightenment happens naturally. Exactly. Uh, it's not something we have to force. Right. We bring that into fruition, and then it happens. Please comment on that. Yeah, I think that's uh, you know I'm constantly pulled back to uh, medical analogies for that because that's you know if we look at some like we could even look at some of the problems with Western medicine and they they learn the body in a very mechanistic fashion right every part of the body the respiratory system the digestive system the nervous system the musculoskeletal system as if each of these is just kind of independently functioning in the body but we know when you look at the body it's all happening at once it's a spontaneous beautiful feedback loop and dance uh, and I think that now you know, people are starting to discuss 
that and, and that's what we see all these people saying things like quantum or quantum understanding you know that's i think i don't bash that use of the term although sometimes it can be a little bit fuzzy but i think that it, it's trying to show that this more kind of like interconnectivity that's that's constantly happening i think that's what we have to look at when we look at the yogic picture of consciousness is that we have maybe we have to use maps of language these kind of linguistic maps to help us understand a structure but then we have to understand that this structure is living and breathing at the same time it's constantly moving i i, I kind of like to use that term that they've used in uh architecture called tensegrity and tensegrity was this concept that you know that everything was had this kind of like breathing interconnectedness and I think that we can, if we can look at that, I, I prefer that idea over this computer idea of the mind, right? That's, that's why everyone's so obsessed in that now. Oh, it's a computer and garbage in, garbage out. And it's that simple. And, um, and, and it, it, we know it's not that simple, you know, for some, it's, it gets, you know, the more kind of clear someone is, the more simple it may be. But, but until that point, it can be very confusing. So I think that's the problem is people still kind of learning these things in such, as such discrete entities like, oh, the ahamkara or the ego, it's bad, put that in the bad corner. Um, the, you, know, you, know, you know, the booty, that's what yeah. I want. It's the best part. And the manas, I don't really know what that means. It's like this emotional thing that, you know, and, and as if they never are connecting. And, and that's even like, you know, from an, like from an agoric perspective or a, a tantric perspective, or even if someone would actually, we could get somewhat technical and say from a Vaishnava perspective, um, they absolutely do not seek to eradicate the ego. Because they would say, if there's no ego, there's no personality that can experience communion with bhakti, with the, with the personality of God. So then they, they don't want to be the drop in the ocean. They don't, you know, they, they'll, you, you'll see in the Vaishnava writings, they'll say, oh, the demon Mayavadi philosophers who, who say that's got, they're, they're demonic. You will be cursed if you have that belief, you know. And, and that's because they felt like, oh, if you lose yourself, how can you love God? There's nothing there to love. And so it's very fascinating um, to me you know, how we can see these different kind of nuances between the different systems. But there's something that you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the term I was looking for is general semantics, and in particular, the book People in Quandaries, which is a, a fantastic way of helping people to understand to solve problems. But at the end of the day, it, it can be summed up in, in, in what we had said, learning how to think clearly, how to speak clearly, because how we think and speak are, are interrelated. And there we get into the notion of mantra. What is the power of sound? What is the power of thinking? What do, the, what do sounds have on form? Uh, and then what do, you know, this feedback relationship that develops. But again, with that, we see this question of the I-ness. What is this I, this individual uniqueness? Even in Buddhism, you know, the, the, the Theravadins, there's no I, but they, then they can't explain what reincarnates. Uh, yes. the, yeah. you know, the, what is this and then you have uh, uh, people who hang on to their eyeness so strongly that they can't open up to anything much beyond it whereas we say the eye is whatever you're identifying with at the moment that's your that's your control mechanism right and so if i open up and identify with something bigger then i identify with something bigger if i don't then i then it's what we think of in that conventional uh modern psychology sense of ego uh, of me as a very limited force of control um, yes it's it's fascinating because as soon as i hear people say so, you know well you got to get your ego out of the way i i, I generally stop listening at that point <laughs> i do too i do too absolutely yeah because if i if i'm if i am not listening then what or who is <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, I even, uh, to me, I, I, I agree with that 100%, and I take it even a little deeper, like for me, like I see this modern or this contemporary push to eradicate true, individ true individualism as equal to these kind of weird aramonic spiritual movements which seek to, uh, quote, eradicate the ego. Uh, it's almost as if they want these kind of robotic people that just can be easily manipulated um, and that's, very, that's a very dangerous concept to me. Well, th this, is, this fits in perfectly because the, the question, you know, we, we came to talk about and people may be wondering, you know, okay, what about the body-centered stuff? When are we going to get to that? Well, this is yeah, all yeah. part of it because maybe you could please explain what the aharimic uh, function is. 
I myself, when I was in my teens, I read all of Steiner. I knew people who, who read Steiner. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I personally didn't find a great deal of benefit from Steiner in particular, but I did find his, some of his notions. And this is yes. what I find interesting. I'm looking at him now 100 years later from stuff he wrote in 1920s. So now we're looking 100 years later and we're seeing a lot of the ideas that he had spoken about coming true. Just as we can look back at uh, Yogananda, many yeah. of the things Yogananda said uh, coming true, which, and of course, these guys are by modern standards would be considered conservatives. Absolutely. Traditionalists. Yeah. Okay. But maybe you could explain the Aharim and the, what we're talking about in, for listeners who aren't familiar with it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I do agree with you. I see that with Yogananda, with Vivekananda, same thing too. You can look at all his writings now, they seem even more important today than ever. Um, I often, when people often talk about, oh, Rudolf Steiner, it's, it's very confusing. I'll often, you know, encourage them to read Rudolf Steiner's book on bees and the plight of bees. And we see all of, because they can sometimes wrap their mind around it, right? It's, it's, it's very clear. It's quotes, quote science. And then they can see, oh, wow, everything he predicted about the issues with bee colonies is happening now. Um, so he, well, that was probably, you know, in my youth of studying Steiner, um, I was much like you. I, I, I found it very pregnant with concepts that I could take and that I could use. And, it was, and I could see these concepts that were, the, and they would influence me in my other studies. I was more steeped in, in Hinduism, but I still appreciated that. And I think the concept of Ariman is very important and this kind of alchemical tension between the, this Luciferian impulse and this Arimanic impulse that's happening. Um, on earth and that of course the Aramonic impulse was this kind of impulse to completely homogenize and standardize all systems of expression or all systems of consciousness where everything became very efficient quote scientific um, and then you know safe equal equality all these terms that we see now as being sold us like you know I even have a joke you know and of course in Austin it's very it's very common to see these houses that are virtue signaling with the signs in their front yards and it says things like you know this house believes in science you know in this house science is real and I always joke with my friends and I say oh, I just want to put up a sign and say this house worships Ariman you know because they would they would totally believe that and and so with Ahrimanic ideas is that there that you know science is always better everything can be measured everything can be you know, conceptualized to this perfect standardized form. And also too, it has a lot to do with fundamentalism that really starts to influence really deep fundamentalist movements, which, which allow no nuance of thinking. Everything has to become dichotomized into left or right or good or bad. And, um, and I think we even see this now, you know, in this w very weird trend of moralizing that we see in the occult world now It's like, the majority of occultists that I talk to, to me, I, everything from people who claim to be followers of Crowley to people who claim to be radical left-hand Satanists, they all just sound like Christians to me. Most of the time, they're, 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 they're always, they're either, you know, quote, fighting for equality or they want to be sure everyone is treated equally or it's very strange. You know, it's like the, the, I don't see any radicals anywhere. And that's another sign of that Aramonic impulse. Um, and I called that in the cult of Gogatha. That was a big influence on that idea. These systems of control. You know, well, that's just, that, you know. that's the sign of the Kali Yuga. Moralism is the sign of the 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 the, the uh, um, I don't what, what do we call it? Is it the the the, the apex of the Nadir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Kali Yuga. Yeah, 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 Which, yeah, yeah. Whichever one. You know, you you don't win either way on that, right? So yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. But, but this goes into the 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 Aharmanic impulse. The movement away from body-centered practices go hand in hand, or the notion of um, transhumanism. Yes. And yes. why transhumanism is fundamentally anti-initiatic. Yes, I totally agree, and, and that's why you, people will often see me, you know, really criticize the, the, how technology is being used, and and almost always the effort, the initial kickback from most people are like, oh, I can't believe you said that. Technology is saving so many people. And then I can just show them a story about something creepy happening in a hospital, about you know a computer telling someone their family died versus a human being. And then they're like, oh, that's so sad. They're just so disconnected from the reality of it happening and how their consciousness is constantly manipulated 
through technology. Um, and, and, you know, Steiner, he wasn't a Luddite. He didn't say that because Ahriman was doing this that we needed to, like, destroy all technology and we, and we need to destroy all science. He was not saying that at all. He was just saying it had to be used in the correct way, um, which is very much a Vedic idea. The idea is that we should use science in a creative way and a, in a, not in just kind of like this Newtonian limited way. Um, and obviously that's influenced by my path in life of studying Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, integrative medicine, and not just becoming a surgeon. I'm fascinated with different types of medicines that aren't just limited by um, what the West likes to call evidence-based, you know, only evidence, except it has to be, well, whoever has the most money has the best evidence, uh, you know, or whoever well, It's has fascinating that you use the term Newtonian because Newton was a student of alchemy. And exactly. His, uh, alchemical research was, was an embarrassment. Uh, yep. to later people, just as Freud's early research in, um, you know, hypnosis was considered an embarrassment. So we see that the people, I hate to say it, but you know, it's the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. Yeah. Yep. So the people in charge decide that they're going to filter out uh, what happens. And we even saw that going into the 19th century, that in the 19th century, there were a lot of uh, back to nature movements uh, right, we saw right, that right. throughout Europe. We even saw it in India. Uh, there was concerns about, in India in the 19th century, there's concerns about technology taking jobs away. I mean, think about that one. Uh, I know. But we see a lot of these movements where um, what we think of as those ideas and beliefs were essentially heavily sanitized or influenced by the people who would act as the spokesman for them. So... We see that happening when Indian ideas are brought to the West in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, and we, where a lot of the more dramatic ideas are, uh, are put through a filter. But uh, that filtering, of course, is a homogenizing, which goes hand in hand with what you had just said about the idea of we're just going to make everything kind of this, this bland and the same. Exactly. Exactly. And that was something that, you know, obviously, you know, really influenced the creation of Waldorf schools, right? Steiner's idea that the education systems had to be different to allow people's consciousness to grow and be taught in different ways. So for example, standardized education would be a complete example of Aramonic. You know, everyone must learn the same thing. They must pay, pass the same standardized test regardless of anything else. Um, and we can see that's, you know, I, I don't think our modern education system is producing a bunch of masters of creative thinking. That that would be uh, that would be a tough one to uh, to prove that it is living up to its uh, its promises of, of education, right? And which goes back to uh, what we also see other people. When I spoke at the univer when I would teach at the university, I'd hear students saying, "Well, why do we have to learn anything? Why can't we just learn enough where we know how to where we, we can learn just enough to look it up on uh, to Google it?" Yes. So th this idea of mastery, going back to this idea of mastery, and the whole purpose of spirituality being to know thyself right goes back to thyself as let's start with the body because that's what i know i have and how does that then work in with the mind so maybe we can move into some ideas that you have on uh body centered practices and their critical importance at this time for people yeah i think that you know as we see this more and more disconnect from reality and with this type of transhumanistic ideas, this kind of selling of technology as some type of savior. Um, and, you know, we can even see this now. I mean, with what's going on in the current situation is, you know, people are literally being sold this idea that, well, you know, you don't even have to really leave your house. I mean, you can even just have the election at home. We can just uh, just kind of mail in the ballots and you can do, you don't even have to go to college. You can just get on your Zoom things and do things like that. It's like this more and more disconnect from people. You know, and of course, you know, we'll probably never have a time when we can shake hands again. And I saw someone yesterday make a comment that they hoped that blowing candles out on a birthday cake was going to be outlawed because it was just too dangerous now. You know, blowing, I mean, the level of insanity of disconnect from the physical body and disconnect from human communication is mind boggling to me. And that more people don't see this to me is extremely troubling. We can take that down into our, our cult practice. And like we were saying earlier, so many occultists just like they buy the books, they memorize these ideas, but it never, they never put it into their body. I like to say they never embody it. They don't embody the teachings. 
Um, they, it doesn't become a part of their nervous system where they start to live it and manifest it on every aspect of their life. And this is why when we see from, you know, traditions from the, the East, whether we talk about, you know, Taoism and Kung Fu, they had a physical component and they also had a psychological component and they also had a spiritual component. It was the same thing with India. They had deep esoteric thoughts, philosophies, but they also had physical practices and breathing practices because they understood that the mind and the nervous system was directly linked to the physical body. Um, and of course, you know, you saw the trends in different systems where they wanted to like escape or transcend the body. And a lot of people in the West really kind of, you know, grokked onto that and really love that because there's so much shame in the West of the body and they're so uncomfortable in their bodies. So they would love to embrace something which says, oh yeah, we don't even need the body anyway. It's almost like some kind of Lovecraft story of a brain just sitting in, to, in a jar somewhere. That's kind of like their fantasy land, right? <laughs> <laughs> like one of like one of the original Star Trek episodes where the brains were just in the sphere. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Letting out electrical impulses, creating the world. Creating the world, you know, and it's the matrix and na, 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 na. But the whole point is that, you know, as we see such a problem with physical health and physical vitality, it's going to be directly linked to psychological health and psychological vitality. We can't escape that fact. And so, and then everything that we experience in the world, everything that we experience through the senses or the indriyas is being channeled through our nervous system. It's being channeled through our, what we smell, what we taste, what we hear, what we feel, and how we move in the world. And so the, the more comfortable we are in our bodies, the more clearly we have the potential to experience different states of consciousness. Um, well, this, so I, this, you, know, you could say that this is what we heard in, 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 from the uh, period of the Babylonian captivity to Judaism to Christianity. It's called uh, thought, word, and deed. In Vajrayana, it's body, speech, and mind. Yep. In Indian systems, it's a slightly different. It's mind, uh, uh, prana, and, um, uh, and action. But it's the same thing. It's mind, the energies of, of life, and then the actions that we do. Because the energies, the prana, are associated with speech. Right. Which are directly associated with the psychic channels and uh, the, the channels, the winds move on the channels. And when, when I hear, think of what's being talked about today and the pictures of people in tents and all of this stuff and uh, the separating of people out and never handshaking again and never touching again, I think of that as a direct assault on the heart chakra. Yes. Because it is the heart that deals with the skin. It is that deals with surface and touch. Maybe you could con comment on that a little bit, how these psychic centers, actually have a real they're not just abstractions they have a real mechanism of the energy moving into the world and then from the world into us that we as a processing point yeah we could even use the example of we would say like bhakti yoga practices and and you know vaishnava systems or shaivite systems or vedic in general and that they would call them they had different kind of flavors or rasas or taste and, you know, and that was something that, you know, whether it was a visualization or whether it was ringing the bells over the deities, the lighting of the incense, the placing of the flowers, the color of the flowers, the smells, uh, all that was affecting one's ability to experience this deity or their, you know, and we can't just kind of imagine that, oh, I just don't need any of that at all. I'm just going to sit and just visualize that in my head, or I'm going to pull it up on the internet. Um, and I think that, there's there's kind of a, an attempt to continue to disconnect people from that but that's also easy to do now because so many more and more people are just already disconnected from their physical body they're uncomfortable they're sick um, they don't they don't they don't like the body um, in general and then of course we have what i talk about you know constantly i personally believe that there's this deep kind of you know shame and moralistic christian kind of samskaras that run all through the West and that people, no matter what they say on the surface, they say, oh yeah, I'm a radical or I'm a left-hand practitioner. But then at the end of the day, they end up just kind of being, like I said, almost these weird pseudo fundamentalist Christians judging people for what they do or, um, and, and being ashamed of the body or ashamed of any kind of physical expression. Um, and then and that just goes on and on ad nauseum over and over and over again. And the, and the opposite seems to be equally true that there's either the, the, there's the shame which you which you've talked about or there's just the 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 reckless self-indulgence yes yeah and it's a blind indulgence right it's just kind of it's, it's not an indulgence that's seeking 
some kind of extent that's kind of radical self-exploration of their consciousness. It's like an indulgence, mm -hmm. which is seeking to numb their consciousness, to stop their, their quote, pain or their sadness. Um, and then as a result of that, it damages the nervous system. And then they, they continue to have problems over and over and over again with that. It's not exploratory. It's escapism to the point of overdose, regardless exactly. of what that drug of choice happens to be, whether it's shopping, sex, uh, whatever drug you happen to be, even occultism, uh, or whatever this happens to be, it starts out as just a means of distracting oneself to the point of oblivion. Um, it's supposed to make us. Well, you, got, you dropped for a period of time there. Maybe you could just back up about 30 seconds. I don't know if you can hear me, Craig, but uh, I have no sound on my end. Okay, Craig, we lost you for a little bit, but you're back, uh, as you were saying. Yeah, so I think that's one of the problems is that, you know, if people are searching or using altered states of consciousness out of, out of sadness, out of depression, and it's turning it into, and it turns into a type of escape, escapism, then they're never really going to advance. And if anything, they'll kind of go further and further down the rabbit hole. Um, um, and so that's something that I think can happen also too in the occult practices if they're doing things and always, that's why I always ask people like, what is the goal of your esoteric practice? Like, you know, what are you really seeking to do? Just like if I saw someone for their health, I'd be like, what is your, what, what are your health goals? Right. If I'm coaching an athlete, I'm like, what are your, what, what are your goals and how are we going to get you there? And then we have to form a plan and then we have to always look at that plan. I don't think that esoteric practice isn't, isn't really any different from that. Um, it should be something which, you know, we can build some kind of architecture of a plan and then kind of guide them there. And, th and then, of course, these Eastern systems, whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism or different things, provide a ton of tools. And then the Western esoteric systems, it's kind of tricky, right? Um, and I, I think that's why so many of the Western esoteric systems end up falling back onto some, some type of uh, mystical Christianity in some sorts, because then they kind of go back to the idea of prayer or the sacraments, right, is almost out of a default, um, not because they truly feel a connection there, because they, they just don't know what else to do, you know? I, th I think that's an interesting point. And, and going in that direction, we could see that, of course, many people look to uh, the, the way Tantra is sold in the West as a kind of a hypersexuality. Uh, there's that kind of, there's that abuse there in terms of the, psych the notion of the psychic centers and, and encountering the energies. Uh, as a, a sense of awakening, and, and, and maybe for some it, it might be, but it's, it's really uh, distorts a lot of the purpose. But then we also see that a lot of these distortions are possible because where are the examples? Uh, yeah. I, I think to the people that I knew when I was getting involved with this in my uh, mid-teens that I had people to look to. Uh, they may not right. be what we would think of as adepts and the common sense people, superhuman but these were reliable people and we could get a sense of what to expect from a practice. What would you become like? Yeah. And this idea that there is a goal that can be observed even that yeah. is perceivable in the sense of that person has done the work and that's what it is like. 
that seems to be tremendously lacking uh, in many schools of thought these days. In fact, it, it goes back to what you said earlier, the idea that, well, it doesn't really matter. You, you may be the teacher, but we're all equal. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good example. It's like when you, that's one of the things I love about, like say martial arts or a physical connection to these practices is because we can, we can literally have some kind of example. Like if you're studying martial arts, you would have either teachers or classmates who had reached a higher level of mastery than you in certain techniques. And you were seeing this constantly. You were just exposed to it. So not only did it inspire you, but it gave you expectations. And then you, you know, no one would go to the school and say, well, everyone's equal. Everyone was a student in the family, but there was different qualities of talent in the school. And they were, they were very clear about that. Um, and same thing. And think, so I think that's one thing that's lacking. And you would see them in the Eastern systems, they would have clear kind of ideas about what this means. Okay, if you're obtaining these certain things, you will have the following experiences. You will have the following things happen. You will start to be able to understand things at a deeper level and manifest your own creation of that, your own expression of that. Um, it's kind of like music too, right? You know, you learn music, you take music lessons, and then after a while you're learning the theory, and then you're able to start writing your own songs, and you see that happening right before you. It's like very clear, um, as opposed to saying like, oh, 10 people taught, you know, taught them how to play guitar and no one can write a song, right? Then they're just, they're just kind of monkeys. They're no different than they're just kind of memorizing or, or a parrot and memorizing something. You know, I think that's an issue now. We see that a lot. Well, uh, that's we are, I was always taught, and it was particularly true from any of the uh, uh, the Oriental teachers. Was what is the origin of the teaching? Yeah. What is the teaching? And with that meaning, what is the teaching and the practice? You maybe could separate those if you wanted to. Right. But it's usually given us the three: what is the origin of the teaching? What is the teaching practice? And what can you expect from it? That is, what what is it going to do you're doing something for a siddha an accomplishment right you were to accomplish something through the uh, city some something is to be accomplished through this practice what is that what does it look like and how are you going to recognize it when it's done and within yourself it's huge and uh, you know it reminds me of, of many uh, of some of my most important tantric teachers from india you know they would often give me a certain sadhana right and they would, whether it was, uh, ex and, you know, it was usually an extremely detailed ritualistic environment with an extremely detailed certain mantra to, on, to be done on certain phases of the moon, certain times. And then they would kind of say, okay, see you later. And then it, I would come back with experiences and whether or not those experiences were according to them valid or correct, they would, then I would advance, right? They'd be like, oh, you already had, now you had this experience. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> so, you know, you know, I'd be like, Is it, does it make sense that the following three things happen? They'd be like, ah, oh, perfect, next level, you know? And so then you're like, okay, you had some kind of feedback and that, they didn't just say, well, everyone's equal in here. Everyone's going to get the same mantra and everyone's going to get, the, this didn't work that way. But I also had to do a lot of my own work, right? And then I had to, kind of make note of all that work and go back and discuss it with the mentors and the teachers. And then we would have discussions and then go back. And uh, so that, I think that's, that, that's lacking that even of itself is just that kind of mentorship factor is really lacking. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, I remember doing things, you know, you say, okay, well, here's the practice, you know, go do it for three months. Yeah. And I'll tell people go do something for a month or 40 days. It's really 40 days you know, but 42 days and, and, and they look at me like I'm out of my mind. And oh, I said, totally. well, that, that, that's like the minimum. I said, I, would, I did that for three months. What do you yeah. mean? Every day for three months, that's it. Yeah. But this, just so listeners have an idea as to where we're going here too, that these things have a, uh, a dimension that is transcendent, truly transcendent. Uh, you and I did a, an experiment uh, last, uh, last year. Yes. Here. It was wonderful. And I, I called you up and I said, hey, you know what, I like to do these things, by the way, because of my background in kind of in experimental occultism. And I said, give me a mantra. Yes, yes, yes. said, okay. Yes. So you grabbed, I said, don't tell me what it is. I don't want to know anything about it. Just give me the mantra. And so you give me the mantra and I said, okay. Now I knew I was committing to the 40 days of doing this. Right, right, right. I have at least one recitation a day, one mala a day. So 108 recitations a day minimum. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to do this. And 
then I would, I called you about, uh, or sent you an email about two weeks in, three weeks in. And I said, now this is the dream. Yes. And, yes, and then, I, then I said, okay, now let's wait. We got to wait now. And then as, you know, as it would progress, there'd be these other benchmarks. And after by the 40 day point was over, I think we had three key benchmarks, which would kind of be typical. Yeah. But, but it was great because, you know, why am I dreaming about an elephant? Yeah. Yeah. And totally. it was a Ganesh mantra. Uh, and uh, it's, that's beautiful. And it's also the same experience you had when we, we, we kind of met in that kind of like uh, almost astral church, right? Mm -hmm. we had, oh, here it is. This is it. It's the same place. I saw the same exact architecture at the same this. It's, you know, Steiner was big on that. You know, that's kind of why he used to call it a spiritual science, right? He wanted to be sure that we could all agree. We all had, you know, agreed upon language. Um, that we would see that. So I think that's something that there should be benchmarks. And I see that thrown out now to people like, Oh, it just every, every, every person had their own personal experience. And it's all different. And, and, that, and that looks good on paper and in advanced levels that's happening. You know, you know, I could use the analogy once again of Kung Fu. It's like on the advanced level, you do kind of have a different feel, you know, it's like, it's like jazz, right? Like, yeah, at the advanced level of jazz, there's a lot of spontaneity. And people can be extremely creative and very weird and bring it back around. But that's at a super advanced level. Before that, they have to learn certain kind of structure, learn you know, different kind of standards. Um, they don't just skip around with that. Um, so I think that these are very important concepts to discuss. Well, spontaneity without uh, foundation is uh, chaos. It spins out of control. So the question then is, uh, looking at your knowledge of various practices and schools, things we've discussed previously in, in this, uh, in this uh, talk. What specific practices or possibly resources uh, could you suggest to students that they should look at in terms of um, ways to cultivate their mind uh, uh, and ways to develop body-centered practices, which we're going to have some more things on for folks to, to access, but uh, what psychic centers even would they should they begin to think about as being critical uh maybe even how to and the final question of these four maybe uh if they've got to just say you know I, i've got to start from the beginning all over again uh within a western framework though but what can i do so there's some ideas some questions for you maybe you could address them please yeah i think that that's one that's one of the reasons why i often recommend everyone regardless of what path they have to learn the limbs of Raja Yoga and go through that. And mainly the, the, the starting with Pratyahara and, you know, going from, you know, maybe even, you know, of course, I, you know, that's kind of, I kind of maybe make a mistake there because I assume that means that everyone's familiar with Pranayama and some type of breathing. So I should probably say everyone should be familiar with breathing exercises and how that affects their consciousness. But once they move past that, the concept of Pratyahara or kind of turning off the senses is very important. And that can be applied to any system. And then from there you enter into the inner limbs of yoga, which, you know, which would be dharana, you know, which is concentration and focus, you know, dhyana, meditation proper, and then the higher levels of samadhi states um, and some yoga, that which of those together. So I think people should study that, whether they're, no matter what system they're doing, they should kind of learn about what Pratyahara is, what Dharana is, and understand that Pratyahara and Dharana precede meditation, right? They precede, they prepare the mind to be able to meditate. Now I see a lot of people in esoteric practice, they don't know any breathing, they don't know any, any way their senses work. They have zero concentration and they brag about it usually. They're like, oh, I'm ADD or I'm ADD or I can't concentrate or I'm, I can only concentrate when I smoke a joint. Then I'm like, ooh, then I'm super focused, you know? And then, then so they kind of want to skip all that and just jump right into meditation. Um, so I think they need to learn the, what, what are the preceding stages to prepare the mind space for meditation proper. And then they need to spend a lot of time learning about meditation proper. And that right there, right? That's like what a two, three year course of study. Um, and then, you know. It, it, well, it reminds me that, you know, as, as, a, as a child, the things that, you know, <laughs> that strangely are emphasized are, you know, posture and breathing. Yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes that was just, you know, not to be a slouch, but it was also, you know, sometimes esoterically meant. 
Yeah. You know, because if yeah. your posture, as when you walk, sit, lay down, if your spine isn't proper, then the, the energy doesn't flow properly. And the same with the breathing. If you're not learning how to do deep abdominal breathing. I mean, I knew people who were not necessarily occultists in the sense, but they did breathing exercises for health. And, uh, and it had tremendous health benefits, uh, just in learning how to breathe properly. So, but that was kind of old school. I mean, that was an early 20th century thing that I saw, you know, just surviving on there. So the, na the nature of posture, how to sit, how to be still, how to breathe. And then if that's done properly, then the sense withdrawal becomes easier. Exactly. But even there, I remember being told that, the, and maybe you could comment on this, the nature of the prana as the first unit of energy is that the prana actually moves outward from our consciousness. Mm -hmm. So that what we're experiencing too is not a disconnect, but really a, 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 a tether, if you will, or a line, if you will, of connectivity to the sensory world and the various energies or expressions of prana that take place. So when we try to do sense withdrawal, we're actually pulling that energy back into us and moving it back into our consciousness in a way. So what's happening is we're able to use the sensory stimuli of the world as a way of focusing inward because it's no longer hitting us from the outside, if you know what I'm saying. We've withdrawn yeah, yeah. that energy back in, but we have to keep moving it further and further and further till it reaches back into the nucleus of consciousness itself, which kind of hints on the notion of the, 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 the body of light or the rainbow body in Dzogchen. Yes, it does. It does. That's a very good point. And that's a good point, too. It's like when we talk about Pratyahara, we need to make clear it, it's not, once again, it's not this anti-senses like we're anti-body seeking of transcending oftentimes it is kind of kind of marketed as that right oh if we could just turn these horrible senses off i could maybe finally get enlightened you know it's not that it's more about just learning that they're actual doorways and and and, and knowing that the this prana is coming in visually auditorially you know how we smell how we taste how we touch which is a very tantric view of the world that we exist in this just kind of like world full of living entities that are always out. And of course that, that was a huge reason in entering the desert why I talked about this concept of the sacramental vision, right? The sacramental vision was this, be, this ability to experience the world directly with your senses. And it was a world that was in, uh, ensouled and alive, alivened. It was enlivened, it was alive, it wasn't just dead. Um, and that come, oftentimes you had to kind of learn that about your senses to turn it off so that, so that you could see that. This is the magical worldview of the Renaissance and the whole notion of the pneumatic or air body. Again, the prana body for, yep. of, and we know we're using the words kind of poorly, but we, we know what we're referring to here. Yes. Of, of, of the classical theurgic period into the Renaissance. Absolutely. And so I think these concepts are very important. It's this. It's like, a, especially like if we talk about like a magical practitioner per se or an occultist, they want to understand all of their senses closely, how their senses interact with their nervous system. They want to, they want to have a comfortable seat in the body. Like that's what I often talk about, you know, asana being a seat, right? But it also means kind of like a foundation for your ego in the body. And the more, and like you, you really expressed it well, it's like even your posture expresses that. Like even how you hold yourself physically expresses your ahamkara. Um, and, and that's a big part. So if someone is not comfortable physically, then they don't have a, they don't have a stable asana. Even, and, even, you know? and just to give a practical example of that, having worked with many people who will politely say have experienced the criminal justice system. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as you know, from Kung Fu, uh, the criminal is going to go for the low hanging fruit. Totally. And the low-hanging fruit is someone who is not familiar with their environment. They don't have what we call situational awareness. Yep. And yep. then at the same time, what do we see happening? Well, how do I know who the easy victim is? By how they walk, by how yep. they hold themselves, by often how they dress. They're, they're not dressed for the environment they're in. Exactly. I mean, you know, survival isn't just, you know, they say cotton kills. It's not just wearing the wrong clothes for the weather, but it's the wrong clothes for the time and place you may be in. Completely. I 100% agree. And there's so many 
um, metaphors within that that we can apply to occultism. You know, both both for, you know on the astral plane, both in the ritualistic plane, and both how do, what do we take back from our practice, back into our lives, and what is, and how is it helping us to live a more passionate life, a more creative life, and 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 frankly, a more independent life. Well, this is just a great uh, jumping off point for something that uh, you've talked about uh, in terms of um, uh, other interviews, and I know I've talked about in some of the classwork, is with the Ahuramic view that permeates Western occultism. What we see is a very human-centric approach. Mm -hmm. So within that framework, what we see is the idea of there is myself, there is my mind, there is maybe the cosmic masters or some brotherhood of adepts and there is the enlightened state and the and that's fundamentally what composes the universe there is very little notion of the host of invisible entities that may occupy the the cosmos just as there is very little understanding of the host of organisms that might occupy you know a square foot of soil right no, it's huge. And I think that that, that idea is, is very important for people to understand and to apply when they're thinking about philosophy, when they're thinking about um, their, their personal metaphysics and, and, and how their occultism is applicable to their daily lives. And that's another thing, too. It's like, you know, that's why we see so many people have these really like disconnected lives. They'll claim to be a cultist, but then there, there's like this huge separation from their, quote, occult practice and then their daily life. Um, it's like there's nothing's kind of, there's no transparency, nothing's kind of flooding over into changing their life. Well, other people, it's very clear, you can see something's changing their life. Um, but, so there's some kind of disconnect, and I don't, I don't know if it's a disconnect or there's a granthi or a block that's, that's, you know, that's allowing that to not happen, or if their, their occult practice isn't really a practice at all, it's just a social thing, right? Um, they, they're just hanging out in the group or they're just buying the books, but they're not really doing the actual exercises. They have nothing to bring back to the teachers um, to do something. And, and that assumes they even have a teacher. Yes, that's true. Someone that's to true. answer their questions and to, to help them identify what they need to do. And, and I think there in the classical sense, you know, we, you see a lot of the teachers were, uh, they were quite stern and strict. Yes. That this yeah. is a very, and this goes into what we talked about earlier. This is a very Saturnian approach. Yes. Uh, classical yes. teaching is earth centered. It's firm, it's hard, it's unyielding. Uh, it's a foundation in which you will grow upon. And that that's the positive aspect, we'll say, of the Saturn that we need to address. What we've looked at is this aharimic, which is kind of the negative side of Saturn, where that earthiness is not a foundation for growth but that mechanical approach becomes an end in and of itself yes yeah and there, there's really you know i touched upon that i hinted at that in the cult of Gogatha about there's this kind of strange connection between saturn and the moon and how that connects to the earth and that's where a lot of that happens and obviously the moon being a, a you know a symbol of the mind and consciousness and particularly the emotional mind, but also different aspects of the mind. And if that's not functioning, then this Saturnian ray can become very malefic. Um, well, in Kabbalah, if that path is blocked, then there's no real connection to the invisible. Yes, exactly. There's no, at least not on a conscious level, it's just on a very uh, reflexive, habituated pattern level, which is really what we're seeking to free ourselves. When we say, we're seeking to cleanse our karma. What we're really saying is we're seeking to free ourselves from our habituated patterns. Exactly. Exactly. And that's something that, you know, that's why I always talk about people learning yoga and, and no matter what their practice is and to understand that yoga means a deconditioning of the mind, that that is applicable to any kind of practice they have. And that requires a lot of self-discipline and a lot of, and a lot of harsh self-evaluation. Um, and so I think a lot of people, kind of shun that they don't want that they're like oh i thought i was going somewhere where everyone was going to be accepted or i was going to be accepted for who i was or you know these kind of modern kind of concepts but 
yoga is more about you know destroying all these conceptions of who you are so that you can see not so you just kind of became nothing but the actually as you started to see who you truly were finding your own swadharma your own unique path so you could become as we used, they used to say more than human exactly yeah yeah exactly and isn't that Goethe's lament in faust you know yes uh, yes yeah. like all too menschlich human all too human yes and yes. what we're, we're trying to do is become more than human to transcend this human level not that there's anything wrong with it or bad but out of the eight possible uh uh worlds levels of uh, uh, worlds you know there's still many above us exactly or, or should we say all around us all around us all yeah around yeah no. us. yeah yeah it's true yeah yeah i think that's a good point because we use these kind of like we use like these uh you know, directional or spatial concepts all the time, like above and below and to the left and the right. But it's really just kind of like this constant, like enveloping all the time uh, and that you're morphing, and, you know, changing. I mean, that's, to be honest with you, not to go off on a tangent, but that's one of the reasons why I often, when I do talk about ufology and I often say, and I often refer to it as Gnostic ufology, and it's about <laughs> this, you know, it's about this idea that there's not just this me mechanical machine that is flying from another planet, but it's more this strange interdimensional inter physics, much like we're talking about here. It's not an up or it's not a down, but it's everywhere at the same time. It's a complete radical change in our spatial awareness um, our understanding of how that works and that's that's only until people understand that are they really going to kind of get some gold nuggets out of some of these well, mysterious areas that was driven home to me when i uh studied dumo under uh shempen rinpoche who was the son one of the sons of dujin rinpoche right and uh the, during that i remember very clearly and i, the, and I have extensive notes from that pra that time as well as other instruction was that the psychic centers were uh, to be seen really as gateways to other dimensional worlds. Yes. That, you know, this, when we're, when we're working on the, uh, uh, the navel chakra, the navel center, and you're building the heat there and you're moving below it to the junction point of the three channels, which is, uh, kind of like the, um, uh, the pilot light of the whole psychic system, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, when you're working on that and keeping that alive and flaming that you are working on, not just an experience of heat and warmth, but a dimension into the energies of another world. And that as you move through these different psychic centers, whatever they may happen to be, the same thing is happening on, on different levels. And that you, and, and Dubuis mentions this, it talks about it as he refers to how one enters into the different spheres on the tree of life. That yes. he always wrote about these. These are dimensional domains in which you live and breathe and have your being you exist there this is not an abstraction it's not a fantasy it's not a dream it's a it's a very it has its own corporeality if you will that, its own that, body that concept by Dewey was was really 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 important to me uh growing up and exploring even kabbalistic magic and our esoteric practice that was the idea and i found that very similar to this idea in tantric ideas that the chakras were gateways to literally other worlds, literal uh, communication with other types of intelligence. It was not symbolic. Um, and even as a child, I remember getting a book by Prabhupada called Journeys into Outer Space. And it was this amazing book about, no, that these yogic practices will literally take you to another dimension where these other entities live. And you can go there. So it was like, oh, of course. It was very, you know, it was very normal to me as a child. That's, I learned that. I thought that. And so I, I didn't have that kind of limitation in my thought as I moved into deep esoteric practice. And I think that's so important. I remember uh, being told uh, by one Lama who was giving instruction on, on dream practices, dream yogas. And uh, he had said that uh, during the day, the crown chakra and there's always a little bit of discussion as to what is actually meant by that because in vajrayana they seem to take all of the chakras of the head and refer to them as a single unit as the crown yeah yeah, yeah. he goes but he said the crown chakra which kind of i think is more or less meaning that what we think of as the the command chakra that was the adhajana chakra uh that is that is of important during the day and the navel chakra that's important during the day and then he said uh and at night 
it is for the that is the heart and the throat. And what I've noticed is that a lot of people ignore the throat chakra, oh, which is yeah. what really gives them a lot of interconnectedness and integrity between the centers. Yes. And they overemphasize the heart. Yes. And they often ignore the navel. But there's confusion there because when we talk about that group of centers from say the navel or even slightly below it all the way up to the heart, you know, like what, what are all these different centers? Uh, They seem to have the same function or slightly different and different schools of thought have different approaches. Uh, Maybe you could comment on some of that for a bit. Absolutely. And I think that the the concept of the importance of the Vishuddha chakra is really an important area. I, I'm going to write about that extensively in the next Tantric Physics book that I'm working on right now, and its, con- its connection to Shiva, um, how people completely ignore that. And, there's, and as a result of that, they have a radical disconnect between their emotions and their experience of reality, and their, and their emotions and their experience of esoteric reality. Um, if the, in my opinion, if the Vishuddha is not functioning correctly, and if someone isn't experientially aware of how it functions, that concept of sacramental vision will never occur. They'll, they'll just be kind of constantly caught into some kind of mirage of emotional fantasies. Um, and, then, and people tend to latch on to these chakras, once again, like good or bad, right? Like the, the, the heart chakra is good, the, uh, the sexual chakra pr- probably bad, um, earth chakra probably really bad because everything sucks on the earth. And then, the, you know, and then the crown, the crown chakra is probably great. I saw a poster in the eighth grade that talked about the crown chakra. And then the third eye, that's kind of scary because I did that once and then I got scared. So it, it's just like complete confusion, you know, as opposed to the, those existing. And then other than we know through, you know, through tantric systems and through many other esoteric systems, there's quite a few other chakras in the body, right? There's, there's doorway, I call them doorways in the flesh, all out different aspects of the body. And I'm very active in systems that work that and that, that use those as gateways for communication with other entities for them to come into the flesh and you to go other dimensions. That's very, very common. And so I think that the chakra ideas get, they get so simplified, they get so homogenized. Um, and then, and then also too, people just don't really truly explore them and study them um, due, due to their kind of obsession with certain kind of emotional concepts. You know, I remember that Amwork was one of the few schools that placed a great deal of emphasis on the throat chakra. And this is, you know, going back to 1915. Yeah. Um, and they understood, and of course they referred to it as a psychic center, but they understood its, its relationship in terms of metabolism. Yeah. So that yeah. meant both physical health and psychic health and well-being. And that uh, this is one of the few schools that did it. Most of them ignored it completely. Uh, and with that notion of the, the other centers, um, you know, that's where we run into the, the question of what is the powerhouse of the body? Yeah. You know, how, how are we accessing these energies in terms of they are all about power, power regulation, power generation. In, in sense, if we have enough energy or Shakti or power, then we don't really need to worry about much else. Exactly. It, will, it will go where it needs to go. So when we look at the, the, the lower part of the body, whether it's uh, uh, the solar plexus or the navel or the sexual chakras, uh, what do you see as important for people to pay attention to with those? Yeah, you know, a lot of my ideas about that are influenced by my work in Qigong and Kung Fu, where we talk about this concept of the Dantian or the lower kind of grounding there. And that's obviously something which is more about this kind of primordial grounding in the body. Um, and that's that's something that we work with constantly in Kung Fu to be grounded in the body. And then from there, we can circulate things out or we can take things in or we can train a certain way. And so that whole idea of the Dantian is and someone being literally grounded in their body before they even seek to do these other things is very, very important. And so what does that grounding mean? Well, to me, it means a lot of things. To me, it means grounded in a tradition. It means grounded in a, in a true parampara or linkage of teachers. Um, and so those two things are, you know, we have that in Kung Fu or we have that in Taoist practices, those two kind of things linked together and to gave someone. Then the third part was a lot of work, a lot of personal work. And so if you have the tradition and you have the, the history of teachers, the parampara, and you, and you did a lot of personal work or you had your tapas 
your, you know, your own creative incubation, then you would start to feel that grounding. And then from there you could explore what, you know, the microcosmic, microcosmic orbits or the uh, different chakra systems. But if you don't have a grounding in that and someone seeks to go into these other places, it just gets confusing. Um, and then, then if it's also especially discolored with just kind of emotional expectations or emotional experiences, then it gets very, it, it turns into a, like a hall of mirrors very quickly. You know, someone asked me once, they said, well, you know, I, I want to do some energy work and uh, I want to get kind of body grounded, but I, you know, I don't want to do some of these other practices uh, for different reasons. They weren't uh, capable of getting good instruction. They were isolated. And I said, well, just do this then. Uh, just really feel the energy in your body as you breathe. Feel the energy there with deep breathing. And I, I said, but this seems so simple. I said, it is. But remember, that fundamental practice of, of moving from either head to toe or toe to head and feeling the energy in the organs, I said, that awakens your psychic body. That awakens that interconnect between the psychic and the, and the physical and, and merges them. I said, and then move it out through your hands, like to a flower or something of that. You know, we used to do experiments where you'd see how long you could keep a flower in bloom, you know, by yeah, charging yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I said, because that's connecting to the world. That's moving the energy in and through you. In and through you. And, and that is just a simple way to, to really begin that connection. So you don't have to do, you know, Kung Fu. It'd be nice if you could. It'd be nice if you could learn Ni Kong or something like this. But if right. you can't, just physically thinking of the body as, as, as not just a vehicle, but as a as an extension remember a continuity rather than a linkage exactly yeah that's that's why i often talk to about people getting out into nature and reconnecting themselves to nature and that you know that our as we exist in nature and more around more natural environments we can start to see that our our realm of consciousness or our chitta or our our mind body nervous system is like a laboratory and it's where we're actually taking in everything from the world and we're processing it. And then exactly like you said, then we're, everything is going back out into the world. And if we're, if people spend a lot of time in nature, oftentimes they'll start to get glimpses of that. They can start getting little tastes of that, um, which usually initially comes to some kind of like calmness or a sense of peace or a sense of beauty or a sense of overwhelmingness. Um, uh, overwhelming experience of, you know, sunset or the moon at night. So I think that's a big thing I push a lot too. And just like you said, because it doesn't mean that everyone has to become a Qigong master or take Tai Chi. Um, those tools are there, but they don't necessarily need that. It just paying attention to your body as the alchemical laboratory and not metaphorically either, but literally, literally. my physical literally. body is my literal laboratory. Yeah, my, that's my, the, my physical body is my literal temple. And if I treat it properly and I open the channels up properly, I can invite deities into it as part of my worship. We see that in Agora. Uh, yep. We see yep. that in other practices. Yep. So this is uh, maybe if we've got the time, would you maybe like to talk about that for a bit? Absolutely. I mean, that is one of the most fundamental practices of the Agora is that the human body has, is, starts to become this alchemical laboratory, this alchemical or it becomes a smash on or a cremation ground where you can experience that. And of course that connects us to the chode practices, right? The same idea. We see that with that as well too, of course. Uh, and that's of course, then of course we, we could call that tantric. So it's all interweaving in with that, um, that, that, that we're not seeking to escape this body, but we're actually using this body. What someone called was horrible or terrible, we're calling it beautiful. And we're, in it, we're, we're seeking to find through every experience of the senses that we can start to see them as some type of alchemical filter. Um, and we're able to extract something from that. And we're seeking to extract this experience of the numinous in everything and every experience, and then to co connect that into when we have that raza, that taste, um, which over time, if someone is truly doing this, it starts, like you said, it starts to radiate back out into the world. And then people sense that, people feel that, and then you become almost like some kind of radioactive, radioactive device that kind of like sends out prana back into the world, um, for better or for worse, and people around you are affected by that. You know, there's two points there for, for folks who aren't familiar with Chud and, and don't want to do that. Uh, 
you know, when I look at the practices of Ignatius, uh, the Jesuit practices of, of uh, meditation, particularly the emphasis on the, uh, the, the passion of Christ, I've always viewed that as a kind of chud practice because ultimately yes. there, is, there is the descent into the hell realms. There is the preaching to the precarious spirits. There is the bringing them back, bringing them out of the hell realm, onto the earth realm, into the heavenly realm. There is their salvation there. There is also then the final consummation of this in the resurrection body or the body of light, if you want to call it that, the rainbow body. So all of that is taking place within that framework. And that, op that offers those who aren't familiar with those practices, like Chod and, and the, the, the Shamash that you've talked mm -hmm. about, this is a way of approaching it. But also with that, the body as the fire, the alchemical fire. You know, there's four levels of fire in alchemy we often see. And that, you know, some I know take all of their problems and they offer it to the fire uh, in the, the chakra above the guru chakra. Right. Okay. Right. I see other people, I remember all the Tibetans said, oh, take everything, breathe it in, all the toxicity, and give it to the fire down at the junction. Yeah. Let, you know, let that transform it and take that toxicity, that poison, and release, release it so that you have now more and more energy. So that the fires in us that we're seeking to cultivate, and they were also very careful about diet, you know, not to eat extremely cold things because it would negatively affect the digestive fires. Yes. Maybe you could talk about these fires that it's not an abstraction. It's a no. very real thing. Yeah. When we talk about the Agnes in the body, um, it's very important for, to, for people to see. That's why Ayurvedic medicine was so important to be used with yoga and was and well in particular was so important to be used with tantric practices because it started to teach someone how the physical body was functioning and how these metaphysical substances had actually physical expressions in the body and so the agni for example they had the jathar agni in the stomach which was the you know the pilot light of the digestive fire which was you know some type of metabolic functioning but that also had the buta agnis in the liver and the datu agnis in all the tissues and so the agnis and then we had the viveka agni exactly what started our conversation the idea that there's a there's a fire of discrimination you know so we were always trying to cultivate th these fires these flames that were living in the body um, and the, the more these were cultivated, the more that we, we could offer things up to the deities, the more that, that everything we offered up would travel to these other realms. And, but also that it was, a, it was a purification, right? It was a kind of elemental purification of our senses in the body. But Agni and the fires also provided some kind of protection. That it did protect us as well from contaminants, from toxins, from parasitic entities. Um, and so that was, it became functional a type of fire medicine that was functional on every level of the body. Um, and that's why Agni is so fundamental in agoric practices and tantric practices is the, the whole idea of Agni yoga or Agni fire worship is just fundamental and what that actually literally means. Well, you mentioned this notion of the protective energy. And I know Swami Rama said that, you know, when he was very young and they would be out there in the, in the jungle or somewhere in the Himalayas, the, he, he said, well, how did you protect yourself? And he said, well, the, the Swami would say, just always when you go at night, you, you radiate your sphere of energy around you. Yes. And, and that this is taken quite literally. Um, and if you look at some of the, uh, the, the, the Tibetan tantric practices, the, the formation of what they call, you know, the Vajra tent, or these different spheres of energy of fire is, met, is quite literal. And um, again, going back for our, our listeners as, as a base that they may be familiar with, um, you know, Harvey Lewis wrote in one of the early Amorc monographs around 1915 or 1920, somewhere in there, uh, about the, the radiant sphere of light uh, and how that this would actually act as a protective barrier as you were connected to a higher state of consciousness. And, and I just want to touch on that because going into some things, uh, Amorc is very famous for its ninth degree. It has teachings in there that are very different and unusual than most places uh, within the schools of thought, having to do with the, the notion of literally bind and matter and how they interact and how to create them. But I remember back in the 90s, I was asked to do a review class in a temple. And I said, you know, when you're in the sphere, it's different than when you're out of it. So we have to radiate the energy. You have to create it. And people would actually say, walk up to it as it's being done to the person doing it. In this case, I started it. I was the example. 
And you would see people would walk, 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 and then they would just stop for no reason. Right. Or, or they'd kind of walk as if they were walking around along an edge. Yes. And when, and when I'd ask them later on, we'd sit them down and I'd say, okay, now what did you experience? And they say, well, it's as if their mind just went blank. You know, it's just everything just stopped. Their mind just went blank and they, they kind of forgot where they were for a second. That's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I just been... share that with you because I believe that this kind of experimentation, we need to do more of it and we, we need absolutely to do. write it down and communicate it uh, more completely with one another. Absolutely. And, and you would see people, you know, would have these experiences around their teachers in India constantly. You know, they would be around it. Just the actual presence of the teacher would transform them. And oftentimes they would have this, you know, they might have been studying something else, but the teacher would take them out into nature to have some kind of experience, which would radically shift their experience of reality and, and that too. So I think that's something that, you, that we're talking about here and, um, and then having some kind of experience that truly is, I was going to say having an experience that's experiential, but I mean that in the sense that it's not just in their mind. It's not just this fantasy mirage. It's like they were actually having experience through their entire nervous system. They were tasting it, feeling it, sensing that something was weird or it was stopping the mind um, and causing some kind of like blank spot. Um, and they could go beyond that if they knew how. So yeah, this, that's absolutely fascinating. Well, this brings us to maybe a concluding point, if you like, um, is that what we see there from these folks, from these teachings, uh, the constant notion that we, have a impact on our environment, on those around us. This is not isolated to us. This is not an abstraction. The energies work in and through us. They infect our environment in that we are the source of all our own problems. Therefore, we are the source of our solutions and that we as individuals can overcome our problems and that it is simply a matter of will. Will then being defined as a coherent or uh, cohesive coming together of the disparate parts of mind into a single focus. So all those four parts of mind are brought together, or as we say, uh, uh, congruity, body, speech, and mind, there's congruent action. I see that lacking in modern esotericism today, that sense of mastery of self and mastery of life and environment uh, seems to be lacking a great deal. But that isn't that that is clearly an emphasis in these old schools and with many of the teachers that you've known and worked with. Without a doubt. I think that's kind of what I was hinting at earlier when I was talking about how there seemed to be such a, a compartmentalization of these of, of practitioners' lives. Like, oh, well, here's my occult work over here, but that's not really related to my, my role as, in my job, and that's not really related to my family, and that's definitely not related to my political beliefs, and that's not, you know, everything's just so disconnected. Um, with one of the more traditional systems that I've worked with or experienced, they wanted everything to be connected. They wanted it, every experience that you had to have some kind of, you know, radiations into other, all the different realms of your life. And they were hopefully literally tying these realms together. Um, and that's how it should be, in my opinion. And, and that's when we start to see palpable change. We start to see real shifts in someone's experience in reality, their consciousness, their manifestation of their ideas, their ability to use creativity, their, their ability to think creatively within a tradition. Like that's another thing I think is lacking. It's like, yes, you have tradition, but then you also have to eventually learn how to think creative, creatively within that tradition and evolve that tradition. That's the thing I see a lot of people because they can't do that then they bash traditions, right? Because they can't think creatively within, and they're okay, but then all traditions are bad because traditions are just telling us all to do the same thing. And then, but if they really look at the history of traditions that all these traditions were constantly having new teachers, but these teachers were learning, mastering the tradition and then evolving it in their own unique way. And they were able to do that because they were learning the tools, they were learning the architecture, and then they were being able to take their creativity, which was their Agni, which was their fire, and start to create some new perspective, all the while um, showing how it was supported by what they had come before them. And then they were accepted that way. We see that in Chinese philosophy, Chinese medicine, Indian philosophy, Indian medicine, same thing in Kung Fu schools, martial arts schools, the same idea. And I think that that's one of the reasons why now in occultism, we see people that just constantly want beginner's books. They constantly want 
books that talk about books, right? They, they, they never want to have a direct experience. They want to, if they want to read Crowley, they want to read 10 books about someone talking about Crowley instead of just reading Crowley. Or if they want to talk about Bertrand, they want to talk about five different people who wrote about Bertrand instead of just reading Bertrand. And, you know, I think that, so they need to go directly to the source. And then with, and if they go to that source and they don't have any tools and they don't have any framework, then of course they're never going to be able to be creative with it. They're just going to stay there. And that's when we get this aramonic idea that just becomes like this kind of fundamentalism or a vapid kind of nothingness that never really informs them, which we could easily use as, as the metaphor of just, it just becomes a dead letter on the shelf just a book they collected up there. Oh yeah, I remember when I got that book, as opposed to where the, you know, in India, the literature was literally a linguistic embodiment of the divine. Hmm. And so the books were like, they were, they were more than books. They were, they were books that had provided keys and sonic theology that they were able to use and can connect to this. And so I think that's what we see lacking in today's world is this kind of connectivity a creative thinking and then a, a grounded root in a tradition. Well, that's the notion of the, of the magical language in that sound affects our nervous system. What we read affects our nervous system. That's how study can be a proper absorb, uh, study of absorption is, is its own path yes. uh, as it transforms us uh, through study, contemplative study, not, not just memorization, but, but imagining and visualizing where we turn it into a, uh, and please, I, I hate to abuse this term, but a but a tantric practice of visualization, where uh, yeah, yeah. where we, such as uh, the, the the daily lectures that might take place under a monastic environment, right. where as you're reading, the the sermon is read or the lecture is read, but the visualization process is constantly being stimulated, the imagination process is constantly being stimulated, and with that, the sensory, not the physical senses, but the energetic senses that exist within us are being brought forth. And that can then in turn affect the physical senses in the physical body. Absolutely. So we can move from an abstract idea to an intellectual idea to a kind of an emotional response and even then finally into the physical realm where this moves in and through us into the world as a whole and transforms exactly. us. Yeah, it transforms us and it has the potential to transform the world at the same time, um, which that's kind of that we can even tie that back to the idea of the each of our each of the flames inside of us is a spark from the greater cosmic flame and you know and as we transform ourselves and grow we're kind of reconnecting that small flame to the larger flame which is a very gnostic view um, that wasn't that was already going on in india at the same time well as we come to a close then uh what advice would you give to uh, uh students uh, at different maybe phases of their journey, but but on how to integrate these ideas and uh, body-centered practices or any resources you might be able to recommend for them. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, what I would say fundamentally is just to encourage people to start thinking about how their the health of their physical body is related to their esoteric practice. And that could be something as simple as, are they able to sit for a long amount of time? Are they able to to feel comfortable in their body? So that when they do rituals, they're confident, you know, it could be something as literally as simple as that. I would, you know, the more someone feels physically vital, physically strong and physically healthy, when they go to do a ritual, it's, it's, they have more elan vital. They're more, they're stronger. They can radiate that out. Uh, and then, so that's one level. Then I think that would encourage them to start thinking about their mental health. And I don't mean in the sense of what the Western would call, you know, seeing a therapist. I mean more about their ability to, concentrate their ability to focus their ability to change their awareness based on the time of day to watch the cycles of the moon and watch how that might affect how they think uh, how, you know how do they think during the daytime how do they think versus nighttime what kind of environments influence their thought what kind of you know all those things and so, so they can start to see that wow their their nervous system their mind you know if they, if they read something in a day when they're depressed they're not going to understand it the same way and so I, I kind of, that would of course assume that if they were searching for that, then they might have to learn some concentration exercises. They might have to learn, uh, you know, some more ideas about the mind and inspiration and positive thinking. And so, the, you know, which would be wonderful uh, for them in any kind of practice. And so I think that a lot of these tools aren't necessarily 
strictly quote esoteric, right? They're, they're, <laughs> these are tools that you could get from a lot of different ways. Um, and so that's what I encourage people to do to start to see that, wow, like there's a lot of esoteric information in sources that most people don't call esoteric. And the, and the more they learn about how their body works and how they feel comfortable in their, in, their, in their body and how their mind works and how they feel comfortable in their personality, all that's going to inform their occult practice at a deep level. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Well, I want to say thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule. Uh, we deeply appreciate this. And uh, as everyone now is in this period of uh, isolation, if you will, on various levels, uh, some can take advantage of that to move their practice forward um, right. and even find the, the points that are irritating. Find yes. the problems with it. Bring that to your journey. Bring that to your path. Hand that over to the fires within you, the emotional fires, the mental fires. Let it be purified in that way so that it can reveal to you your way. This is the grand way, um, the, as they call it in Martinism at times, uh, the path of return. But we are the ones who must unblock our path. And it's, as I've always been told, the gods help those who help themselves. We have to do half of the work, and then the gods will come and help us the other half of the way. So uh, if you want divine grace, uh, you don't just get in line. You, you've, you've got to build, uh, you know, some structure for that to, to be able to reach up and get some. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you so much.